Hello, I'm Brian Critchell and I'm here today with Justin Tomlinson, MP. Justin is chair of the all-party parliamentary group on financial education for young people that has just published its report. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to reading it. So, Justin, thank you for allowing us to come in and talk to you. How did this all start? Well, uh, just over a year ago, I asked a relatively innocent parliamentary question uh, calling on greater financial education for young people in schools. I was contacted by a national charity called PFEG, Personal Financial Education Group, who said this was an issue that they'd been campaigning on for, for 10 years and that they could help me craft many more questions. So over the next couple of weeks, we submitted around about 30 questions pushing the government uh, for greater provisions of financial education in the national curriculum. We were then contacted by Martin Lewis of MoneySavingExpert.com and he said, this is something I'm very passionate about, can I come and meet you and we can talk about how we can take this forward. So between the three of us, we decided the best thing to do would be to form an all-party parliamentary group. There are about, there's over a thousand of those in parliament on different subjects and we went about recruiting members of parliament and we ended up very quickly becoming the largest in parliament. We then decided to split into four strands the primary and secondary school strand, which is the one that we've produced the report on already. Mm -hmm. The further education, higher education and vulnerable children were the other strands. And as part of the primary and secondary school strand, we launched a comprehensive inquiry. We spoke to over 900 teachers. We had oral evidence from over 50 different organisations, ranging from financial institutions, teachers, teachers' unions, the people who write exam papers, young people themselves. And by bringing all that evidence together, uh, we produced a comprehensive report, which we've now submitted to the government as part of the National Curriculum Review. And we met with the Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago uh, to talk to him face to face about how we thought this could play an important role. And now we are waiting for the conclusion of the National Curriculum Review, where we hope financial education will become a compulsory element of that. That's very encouraging. Uh, and uh, what did the Prime Minister have to say to you in terms of his personal assurance that something would be done? Well, I, he was very supportive. I mean, we've had cross-party support. I mean, one of the reasons why this is the largest all-party parliamentary group is that most people agree with the principle. I mean, you only have to look at uh, some of the surveys that have been carried out. 91% of people who have got themselves into financial difficulty feel that if only they had known better, they would have made different decisions. And obviously, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Well, uh, one can say better late than never, but isn't it a tragedy that, that our country is so far behind in terms of financial literacy uh, that we can have as many people, as you say, who, who are in financial difficulties? Um, where does this uh, get us in terms of dealing with the current generations in the workplace, the sort of people that... Uh, trustee web members, yep. uh, pension web members have to deal with yep. who have great difficulty in understanding the long-term savings and retirement plans that are put before them. Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. This is something that should have been done a long time ago. This is why I'm so passionate about this subject. This is something to me is an absolute given. It should be a compulsory part of, of the national curriculum because future generations should be equipped to make informed decisions. That's the key. We've never said as a group that debt is good or debt is bad. It's all about people with their own individual circumstances being able to make informed decisions. And it's crucial for us that uh, this is done as quickly as possible. My generation actually could to a certain extent get away with it because as we graduated, house prices were rising so quickly, you could get a 100% plus mortgage. So you could rack up all sorts of debts uh, as a young student, get onto the housing ladder, wait for your house price to rise, reconsolidate your debts, getting rid of all your expensive debts, putting it back into your mortgage. Now, the next generation leaving university now, again, faced with high uh, student debts, uh, having to save up large deposits to get onto the housing ladder, not able to get 100% mortgages, uh, all these different pressures. Combined by the fact the market is getting ever more complicated, there are a myriad of different marketing messages to confuse people, and a lot of people just simply switch off completely and then don't do things. And we've also seen, as individual members of Parliament, through our casework, people have got themselves into financial difficulty. Part of the reason is they haven't set money aside for if something goes wrong. Now, the majority of people who get themselves into financial difficulty have done so because of a change of circumstances, loss of job, uh, death in the family, uh, a breakup, and they simply haven't put money aside. So it's a combination of making sure we've got the next generation of savvy consumers, 
so they understand to shop around and that they are equipped to make informed decisions so they will think of the long term uh, and not just rely on increasing house prices. If I think it's fair to say that all financial institutions would benefit from more savvy, informed customers and they see this as an opportunity to, to promote that. They wish to, they are a lot of them volunteer that they would help carry out some of this within schools and this was something actually that we looked at very carefully in our report because there are some very good examples of financial institutions going in. Now that could be a bank going into a primary school teaching children how a cash machine works, how money works. It could be a stockbroker going in talking about how the stock exchange works. As part of the report, we look to uh, take advantage of that. We've recommended that there should be a central database. So if you are a teacher and you would like somebody to come in to talk about pensions, that there would be a list of available organisations who could provide that. That that work would be quality marked, so it wasn't just a blatant marketing exercise. But ultimately, it should be the teachers who lead on this element in the same way that a PE teacher may regularly teach, say, football and rugby, but might decide uh, as a variety that they will have a cricket session and call in the local cricket club to carry that out as they bring a certain level of expertise. But it's certainly fair to say all financial institutions have been extremely supportive. Let me pick up on a point you just made about teacher-led yep. uh, curriculum um, work on, on, on financial education. Um, one of the difficulties that we have, you talk about different marketing messages, yep. is that there, there is an absolute plethora of different types of saving product yep. uh, and a very competitive marketing environment. And this, this Generation Y or the, the We Generation yep. uh, are getting very savvy about uh, being able to search for their own marketing messages. Yep. Um, isn't it very important that the, at a strategic or big picture level, the financial uh, education part of the curriculum has some very clear messages uh, to enable people to differentiate between short-term saving, long-term saving. Yep. And, and uh, isn't this an area that, that for your follow-up work you should be looking at? Um, rather than get people down into different products this quickly, which would of course serve the financial institutions, shouldn't we be focusing our attention on the, the, the strategic development of the curriculum so that at a very high level um, there are some very clear messages? Because um, if we then get the teachers confused about what bits of the curriculum they should be picking up on, um, that doesn't help, doesn't, doesn't sound as though it's going to be uh, very clear uh, as to where they should be focusing their attention for their own particular needs. Yeah, well, first of all, it, it, I mean, those are very important points and we covered those in depth as part of the report because if we are going to get compulsory finance education, we need to make sure it's appropriate and does actually make a tangible difference. So, uh, in summary, in primary schools, we are looking for a focus on mental arithmetic mm -hmm. because we believe that's the building block to allow young people to then be able to actually make informed decisions further on. In secondary schools, we would then split this so that in the maths curriculum, there would be the factual side. So that is being able to calculate. So, for example, calculate the cost of a loan, whether that's a short-term loan, long-term loan, uh, comparing different energy tariffs, etc. In PSHE, it would be the subjective side, where there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer, but it needs to tie in with the changing world. I mean, I've, I've seen examples where it hasn't been so good. I, I went into a primary school to see a financial education lesson taught, and they were talking about checks to primary school children. Now, in all the world of the world, they probably almost certainly won't be around by the time these children enter the, the, the big bad world. It needs to be relevant, and it needs to be appropriate, and it needs to allow people, when they enter the world, to make informed decisions. So Justin, thank you very much thank for you. allowing us to come and talk to you today. I wish you every success with this uh, and the follow-up and hopefully we can come back and talk to you when you get to the next strands uh, around further education um, and, and, and so on. Brilliant. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that interview and um, I look forward to your comments on the site as always. Goodbye.